दिस लेक्चर नंबर इलेवन ऑफ क्लाइमेट डेटा साइंस एंड वी विल नाउ टूडे फिनिश द डीप लर्निंग स्पेशलाइजेशन एंड दिस क्लास विल बी लाइक फ्रॉम टू टू थ्री and then uh, we will will do a data analysis session after that so we were talking about sequence models in the last class and so sequence models can do lots of different things from time series to natural language processing the advancement the advances in uh, sequence models they have been driven by mostly by the natural language processing tasks nlp applications and uh, so we saw in the last class we saw a very basic form of <coughs> sequence model known as the rnn or uh, the recurrent neural network the different types of rnns one to one one to many many to one many to many so within many to many also there are like we can we can have the different architectures so today we'll talk about language model and sequence generation so uh, like what what basically is is a language model so for example you are having a speech recognition problem now a speech recognition problem is that uh, you are having the input as a speech text or a wave or an audio file and you are trying to build a model which will then uh, it's like it's like auto caption generator okay so it's that that's the speech recognition problem and now for example uh, somebody has said a sentence uh, the apple and pear salad so it can be interpreted as uh, so pear like the the system the like pair and pair sound exactly the same so how would a speech recognition application choose between the two so that's where the language models come in and it gives a probability for the two sentences so you will get a probability you should uh, you should get a higher probability for 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 this sentence because uh, the the language model should be able to understand the context of of the conversation and uh, so based on the probability the application so the model decides the best model uh, best uh, possible option and uh, the job of that's the job of a language model to give the probability to any any sequence of words now how to build a language model so first of all you will basically need a training set a large corpus of target language data now once you have got this big language data you will have to tokenize this training data by getting the vocabulary and then one hot each uh, perform one hot encoding on each word so the end of the sentence you have to use a uh, common keyword so or something uh, common syntax so for example it is eos and the uh, unk is used for the unknown words so for example we have this sentence cats average 15 hours of sleep a day and for full stop so we have this eos end of sentence and so this is a sequence so you can see this is an rnn so cats average and the last word is day so the the loss so you will output uh, you so you will output from here the probability of average given cats so that's the that's what you will output as y2 we're trying to predict the next word now for average so you, you will try to predict get the probability that probability of next word given cats average and the the output of this day will be probability of eos conditional to 
the entire sentence that is cat average 15 hours of sleep a day so you are basically trying to predict the next uh, the next word and the loss function is defined by you can have this cross entropy loss so which is y i so sigma so minus sigma of y i log of y hat i so y hat is the model predicted value and y i is the is the actual actual uh, word so this would be this would be in the one hot encoded or the in the numerical form of the word now to use to use this model for so uh, for predicting the chance of next word we feed the sentence to an rnn and then finally get this y hat t hot vector and sort it by maximum probability so for taking the probability of the sentence we compute for example probability of uh, y1 y2 y3 so that will be probability of y1 uh, probability of y1 into probability of y2 conditional to probability of, conditional to y1 multiplied by probability of y3 conditional to y1 and y2 so that's 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 the uh, that's the probability of of the entire sentence and this is simply feeding the sentence into rnn and basically multiplying the probability so these these probabilities you can see these are basically these probabilities the the probability of next like the word uh, at at the time step t plus 1 conditional to all the words before it in that sentence now so after a sequence model is trained on a language model so to check whether the model has learned you can apply it to a sample novel sequence so you can you can apply this model to a to a sequence that the model has not seen and uh, so so andrew gives the following steps uh, to sample novel sequence from trained sequence language model. So first you pass this a0, which is the zeros vector, and x x1. So x1 is is also a is also a zeros vector. Then you choose a prediction randomly from the distribution obtained by y1 y hat one. For example, it could be the the word that that is predicted would could be the so in numpy this can be so you randomly uh, choose the prediction from this from this uh, distribution and uh, so this is a line where you get random beginning of the sentence each time you sample a sample run a novel set sequence so you are basically trying to create a novel sequence using your model and you are trying to see whether that makes sense or not. Now we pass the last predicted word and calculate A1. And uh, so we keep doing three and four steps for a fixed length until we get the EOS token. So you keep, so you, you randomly, so to check that the model has learned or not. So you randomly start with a word and you give it to the model. The model will give you the next word. So the model will compute the probability of the next word conditional to the word that you are providing. For example, that could be the. So it will give you the apple. For example, it will, the next word it will give you is apple. So then now you the, the apple, this sequence goes in the model and the model tries to predict the next word. So you keep doing this until you encounter the EOS token. So until the model gives you an end of sentence, you uh, you keep you keep getting the next word, and you can keep uh, you can even reject any unk token if you mind finding in your output. So that's how you would you would basically check, and if that sequence that has been generated the mod by the model, it makes sense, then you can you can consider or you can think as if the model is uh mod as if the mod the language model has been trained so for until now we have we have uh, we have seen how to build a word level language model wherein we the one unit of input or output is 
is a word which are so and so many words make your vocabulary or your dictionary and it is also possible to implement a character language character level language model so in character level language model you will have the characters from the vocabulary will be small letters a to z the capital letters a to z the number 0 to 9 punctuation special characters space so you will have all those things now your model will try to make a new word uh, from like it will train you will train it from the available data and it will try to predict the next word that's the that's the task of the of the model now character level language model has some pros and cons compared to the world level language model so there won't be any unk token so it can it can basically create any word and if it is bad it will start creating words which are not even in the dictionary and uh, you will end up with much lo longer sequences character lang level language models are not as good as the word level language models at capturing long range dependencies between how the earlier parts of the sentence also affect the later part of the sentence and also they are more computationally expensive and harder to train so the that's the trend andrew says like nlp has seen for the most part is that a word level language model is still used but as computers get faster there are more and more application where people are at least in some cases starting to look at more character level language models and also they are used in specialized applications where you might need to deal with unknown words or other vocabulary words a lot they are also used in more specialized applications where you have a more specialized vocabulary so then uh, this was about the word level language models and character level language models now uh, we will touch upon a topic of vanishing gradients so as you can see this is an unrolled architecture of an rnn now in an rnn we we can see that a sequence so it can even have a size of 10000 time steps uh, and lot of layers so for example 10000 deep layers it's very hard to optimize such a model and you will end up with the weights which are numbers or which are fractions they are continuously being multiplied with each other so then eventually the numbers will become very small so suppose we are working with a language model a modeling problem and there are two sequences that the model is trying to learn the cat which ate something blah 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 was full the cats which already ate and then again that same sequence same sequence comma were full and dots represent the words in between so what we need to learn from here is that was came with cat so you can see was came with cat and were came with cats okay so the naive rnn is not very good at capturing the long term dependencies like this and as we have discussed in deep neural networks deep networks are getting into the vanishing gradient problem so as you increase the number of layers in the in the in the network in the rnn the, you will you will uh, you will end up into this vanishing gradient problem and this also happens if they have a long sequence data so the problem basically is that a lot of weights are getting multiplied with each other and so for computing the word was we need to compute the gradient for everything behind so to compute this word was so you have to compute everything that comes before this word and multiplying fact fractions tend to vanish the gradient when while multiplication of large numbers get to explode it so if you if you multiply a lot of fractions then you will tend towards zero if you or if you will multiply numbers greater than 1 then you will end up in exploding the gradients or your uh, gradients will tend towards infinity and as, as if you remember when we talked about the gradient descent algorithm so the weights are updated by the gradients 
so if your gradients are going towards zero then your weights won't have any updates if your grade gradients are going towards infinity then it's like the model is unstable or it's blowing up so therefore some of your weights may not be updated properly and so we we have described uh, it it's so we have so it's hard for the network to memorize <coughs> was word all the way back to cat so we are we want that the model should learn that this word was was associated with this word cat and this word were was associated with this word cats which is a long range dependency and it's difficult for the model to learn that because it's it's a long term dependency and the model uh, suffers from like at least rnn it suffers from a vanishing gradient problem so in this case the network won't identify the singular or plural words so that it gives the right grammar form of the verb was or were so the conclusion is that rnns aren't good at long term dependencies and in theory rnns are absolutely capable of handling such long term dependencies but that's only in theory and a human could carefully pick parameters for them to solve toy problems however in practice rnns don't seem to learn able to learn from them now there are a very nice set of visualization by uh by this guy what's his name see christopher yeah christopher yeah so uh these are most of the places where you would see the visual representation of rnns you would see it from this blog and so he explains so he shows this rnn as a as a as as like a folded rnn as as this uh, form where you have xt uh, inputting to a which is a uh, rnn unit and then the output is ht now if you want to open this up then uh, you can unroll the rnn and you can have x0 x1 x2 up to xt so you will have this problem of long term dependencies in rnns wherein so you have x so if you are trying to trying to form like or uh, if you are trying what you are trying to do is something similar to similar to uh, this problem wherein you want to associate was with cat and were with cats so that's like associating this h3 with x1 or h t plus 1 with with 1 so that's 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 difficult because a lot of these computations will take place which are basically matrix multiplications of the weights and if that happens the uh, the gradients will tend to like if you multiply even 0.5, 0.5 or 0.7 a number which is less than 1 you take power of uh maybe 10 20 100 that number will tend towards zero so yeah as we discussed in deep neural networks deep networks are getting into the vanishing gradient problem and it also happens with rnns with long sequence length okay yeah we have already done that so vanishing gradient problem tends to be bigger uh tends to be the bigger problem with rnns than exploding gradient problem so you won't find that much of exploding gradients in rnns because you multiply a lot of weights and it just ends tends to zero and so exploding gradient problem at least you can solve using a method known as gradient clipping so gradient clipping is that if your gradient is beyond a particular number so if it is greater than for example 1 then you bring it down to that threshold the upper threshold so you say that it is 1 so without gradient clipping so this is your for example if this is your 
loss function and this plus is the optimum loss at which you want to reach so without gradient clipping you can see that there would be divergence but with gradient clipping we would reach at our goal so solutions for the gradient uh, exploding gradient problem are so truncated back propagation so you don't update all the way weights like all the way back so don't go all the way back to the first layer however that is not optimal as you would not update all the weights another option is to do gradient clipping and then the solutions for vanishing gradient problem they are uh, so you can do you can do an intelligent weight initialization like he initialization or zavier initialization you can use eco state networks we'll discuss what eco state networks are so that's a uh, another branch of of uh, ai and machine learning and it's a part of something known as reservoir computing and then we we can use lstm or gru network so which are which are more popular than uh, than rnns and so we'll we'll discuss that next. so gru is a full like short form for gated recurrent unit and it is an rnn type that can help solve the vanishing gradient problem and can remember the long term dependencies so this this uh, so you you change rnn in such a way that you try to address the vanishing gradient problem now the basic rnn unit you can visualize as this long term memory a at t minus 1 coming in and uh, you have the xt input you apply you perform a, a linear combination on both of them xt and at minus 1 and then you apply this non linear activation function tan of h and uh, so then you give an output a softmax output and also uh, so you pass through softmax layer and then you get the output and also the uh, the The, after applying the nonlinear activation, this A T is the output of applying the nonlinear activation to X T and A T minus one, the linear combination of those two, and which is going as a long-term memory. So, G R U also uh, can be represented by by a similar drawings. So we'll see if we have the G R U here. No, they only have the. yeah so they only have the the lstms which we will we will see so in gru what do you have uh, you in each layer of gru you also have a new variable c so which is which we call as the memory cell it can tell whether to memorize something or not and uh, this c is equal to at like this a which is in rnn so ct in gru is equal to a at at and if you see the equations so you would take a linear combination of ct minus 1 and xt uh, you would take a linear combination you would multiply them uh, with this weight matrix add the bias term apply the non linear activation and then you have this update gate so you have the wu which is the update gate so uh, which is also applied on this c t minus 1 and x t so this is and then you apply the sigmoid function to this which is the which is the update gate and then you say c t equal to tau u into c hat t plus 1 minus tau u into c t minus 1 so this parameter this update gate it is telling whether to keep in the memory which is coming from the past or not so if the the value of this tau u this is equal to 1 so you see if this is equal to 1 then this past memory which is coming which is coming from the from the previous sequence so that so you are basically telling the model not to learn anything from that and you are telling the model that okay we are 
removing everything from the buffer memory and you should only you should only consider the new memory ct that we have computed now the update gate is between values between 0 to 1 and to uh, so you have to understand that it it is uh, always between 0 to 1 and to update uh, so we update the memory cell based on the update cell and the previous cell so if we take the example of uh, the the cat sentence example and apply it here so the sentence let's say we have the sentence the cat which already ate dot 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 comma was full so we will we will suppose that uh, the update is zero or one and is a is a bit that tells us if a singular word needs to be memorized or not so splitting the words and getting the values of c and uh, this u which is the update gate this this tau u what we are representing here and uh, putting it in the form of a table so we can see that this word the its update cell is update gate value is zero and it has got a cell memory val so anyways if it is zero then it's not propagating further then we have this cat whose update gate is one so that needs to be memorized so we have this new val so this val was not remembered now new val is computed for the cat so it is this that's the that's the ongoing cell memory now these words uh, also let us assume that they will get the update gate values as zero so the long term memory will be the same so you won't have so you are not trying to memorize these things these words and then uh, for example like this is what you want so what the model should actually do so was also should be kept in the memory so its update gate value should be one so that this cat and was so the model is able to understand a linkage between the two words cat and was and now since was uh, also has got its own cell memory so it will be so the the incoming memory cell memory is updated with the computed cell memory of one so you can see the drawing so you have ct minus one and you have xt first you apply the tan h then you apply the sigma uh, sigmoid with the sigmoid it is the update gate with the tan h it is the long term memory you combine both of them to get the uh, to get the long term memory ongoing long, long term memory and uh, so because the update gate is usually a small number like 0. 0.00001 grus don't suffer from the vanishing gradient problem and in this equation so this this makes ct equal to ct minus 1 now we will see the the long short term memory networks so ls or which are popularly known as lstms so these models rnns gru lstm these are these we are discussing although in the context of language models they can be easily or they are in fact directly applied to the time series problems so lstms is a form of rnn that can enable you to account for long term dependencies and it is more powerful and general than than the gru so in lstm the c tau is not equal to at or ct equal not equal to at so you would compute so you would basically have these gates forget gate update gate and output gate so in the forget gate you have the xt which is the input the the value at time t and the a t minus a at t minus 1 you take a linear combination of both of these and you apply apply a forget gate to to uh, to both of these so the forget gate here is tan h or uh, no sorry that's the that's the sigma 
yeah so that's the that so that's the you apply a sigmoid function to that so that's the forget gate then you have the update gate so in update gate so this is your this is your update gate so you take a t minus 1 and you take x t and you uh, so w u is your is the are the weights of your update gate and you apply the sigmoid again to both of them so that's that's what you get here and then uh, so you also compute this ct which is uh, the non linear activation applied to the to the linear combination of xt and at minus 1 and you multiply this ct with the output of the update gate so you and once you do that you sum it up with the with the product of the output of forget gate and ct minus 1 so you can see that ct minus 1 into forget gate plus ct into update gate so that is your that is your long term memory ct which is ongoing and then you have an output gate so in the output gate uh, you also have so again you have a sigmoid you apply x Uh, apply it over the linear combination of x t and a t minus one, and uh, so you also apply a tan h to the long term memory c t which you just computed, and take a product of the uh, so tan h of c t multiplied with the output gate. So that is your that is your a t, and then your uh, so from your a t. you can apply the the soft mass function to at and get the output corresponding to that particular time t so these are the these are the computations of a of a single cell in an lstm so you can see that uh, they have they have explained uh, in this blog nicely lstm has been explained so you have the forget gate the update gate the output gate so the forget gate uh multiply you you take the xt at minus 1 linear combination non linear activation multiply it with the long term memory ct minus 1 which is coming and then in the update gate you uh you apply the linear combination of uh x to the linear combination of xt and at minus 1 you apply sigmoid and then you also apply the tan h to both of them multiply them and then sum uh so sum up the the output of of these two operations and uh with the so with the ct minus 1 into the uh, forget gate and then you have the you have the output gate so which is you multiply tan h with ct minus 1 and you multiply so you take the sigmoid of xt and at minus 1 and you multi so you multiply so tan h of ct ct multiplied by the sigmoid of the of the xt and uh, at minus 1 you pass it on as the long uh, as at for the next cell and also take the sigmoid and which is the output at at that particular cell so that is that is the uh, and those are the those are all the computations that happen in an lstms so there isn't there isn't a universal superior between lstms and its variants so one of the advantages <coughs> so gru has got the advantage that it is simpler and you can can be used to build much bigger network but lstm is more powerful in general so lstm was the LSTM was the state of the art until until the year 2018. So this is a very popular blog. The fall of yeah, the fall of LSTM. Uh, so LSTMs were popular. They did a lot of great stuff. but then people found out something known as transformers the name is inspired from the transformer movie 
because transformers can can do so many things uh which which uh which typically deep neural networks were not able to and uh, they use this uh, this thing known as attention so we will discuss that and uh, have been very successful in the in the language in the language models and also people are using them now for for computer vision tasks for for the time series problems so there there is this paper that you should be aware of so the title of the paper is attention is all you need is cited like thousands of times now and this is what is driving all the uh, like the search engines and uh, the natural language processing today so coming back so we just like so we we discussed about rnn gru lstm now just like uh, so in in all these three different models we saw that there is only forward propagation happening or computations are happening only in one direction but you can also have something known as a bidirectional rnn or bidirectional lstm so the difference between rnns and grus and lstms are in those particular cells that is the core of that algorithm you can just change those cells and it becomes uh, an lstm from an rnn or a gru from an rnn or uh, vice versa now in a bidirectional recurrent neural network so it's typically like putting two independent rnns together so you you can see this structure of this bidirectional uh, recurrent neural network now why this these are required is because uh, the relationship in the input sequence might so the the word for example when we were when we when we were seeing this yeah so let's say we saw this this sentence you can think of the thing this in terms of a time series problem so when we do the computation only in one direction so the the words which come later on you are you are telling the model that only they can only have the relationship to the words prior to them so the the reverse type of relationship it's very difficult to uh like it's it's very difficult to understand for example uh yeah so this sentence he said teddy bears so double quotes teddy bears are on sale exclamation double quotes end so the name teddy it cannot be learned from he and said but so but can be learned from bears so this this word teddy it's related to bears but not he and said so but but the way in which rnns and lstms and uh, grus typically traditionally are designed is uh, is a way that in a way that this word teddy can uh, you can infer only from the words he and said so if you remember the probability of uh, probability of teddy or so the the pro probability so of this word so this y2 is equal to probability so that's the probability of the next word such that he and conditional to he and said so you would want to make sure that it's it flows in the opposite direction as well so that the word teddy can be inferred from the word bears as well so the information flows in both the direction so for that we have these bidirectional rnns so using bidirectional rnns you will run your input in two ways one from past to future and one from future to past so and in this the way uh, so what differs in this approach is that uh, in the lstm that runs backward you preserve information from the future and using the two hidden states combined you are able in any point in time to preserve information in both past and the future so you can see that you have this forward uh, like this this lstm or this network or this rnn is taking the information
information forward. You also have this backward flow information flowing network. And then you the input X at time at a particular time is fed same. The, the same input is fed to both the networks. And the output, their output is then combined to ultimately get the information uh, which which takes advantage of both forward and backward uh, flow of, of, of the knowledge. So that's about that's about the bidirectional RNNs. And um, then comes the concept of deep RNNs. So until now, what we have seen, the RNNs that, that we have seen were just, we were just seeing one layer. You can also have multiple layers. So more than, uh, so we have seen in, in the beginning while discussing multi-layer perceptrons that if there are more than, so more than one hidden layer in the network, then we call it as a deep neural network or the, the learning that happens is known as deep learning. So we can, you can see that if you add more layers to the more RNN layers, so that becomes, that inherently becomes a deep, deep RNN. And uh, so in feed forward networks, there could be even 100 or even 200 layers and stacking three layers is already considered deep and expensive to train. So now, uh, now comes the very important concept of word embeddings. So we were seeing in the, in the initial classes, we have seen the example of collaborative filtering uh, or we, we have even di discussed the Taken's embedding theorem, wherein even in a time series, you would create an embedding at each time step. Uh, so you would basically create an n-dimensional state space of the system uh, from a single time series. So that is something similar to word embeddings, or I would say maybe those ideas are inspired from word embeddings. So we'll see what are uh, what are word embeddings, and so NLP has been revolutionized by deep learning, especially by RNNs and deep RNNs. And this material is from 2018, so this statement should be especially by transformers and their variants. So RNNs are no more the state of the art, and but word embeddings uh, we still use in the in the transformers because that's a that's a pre-processing building block so word embeddings are a way of of representing words and it lets your algorithm automatically understand the analogies between words like king queen so we have we have defined our language by a by a vocabulary and then we, what we did was we represented the words as one hot encoding or one hot vector that represents the word in a vocabulary. For example, uh, this word man. So we have, let's say we have a, a dictionary or a vocabulary of, for example, 10,000 words. And the word man comes is the, the index is 5391. So just the index number, like the the uh, element in the vector at the index 5391 will be one, all others are zero. Similarly, woman is coming at 9853, king at 4914, queen at 7157, apple at 5456, orange at 6257. So in all these kind of one hot encoded representations, we can see that uh, all the other elements of the vector are zero just the just a single number is one and we we will use let's say we use the annotation o idx for any word that is uh, represented with the one hot like encoding in the in this image and one of the weaknesses so there is uh, so although we have represented the words in a numerical form there are some limitations to this kind of one hot word encoding and one of the weaknesses of this representation is that it treats a word as a thing that itself. So it's 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 a it's an entity on its own, 
and doesn't allow the algorithm to basically generalize between words. So for example, I want, uh, so if you want to predict the next word and you give the model this sentence, I want a glass of orange dash. So the model should predict the next word as juice. A similar example will be uh, like I want a glass of apple and model. So the model won't easily predict juice here if it was it was trained on it. So so if you if you have these two examples which aren't related, so these are two examples which aren't related, but apple and orange are uh, are similar. So the inner product between any uh, one hot encoding vector is zero and the distances between them are the same. So if you just take the products of of these one hot encoded vectors, so just the values, all the numbers except one, all of them are, are zeros. So, so what he says is like, instead of having a one hot encoded representation, why not? why not have a featured representation? So for example, uh, the word man, man has got different features. So one of the feature is that the gender, another feature is whether the man is royal or not, what is the age, the food habits, the size, cost, uh, were alike. So women also will have all these features. King will have all these features. Queen will have apple, orange. All the words will have uh, will have these uh, these different features. So, for example, we consider 300 features, and uh, we assign some numbers to to these uh, to for for each word, uh, like for each feature corresponding to each word. So, each word now will represent will be a 300 dimensional vector. So, which will be the representation. So, rather than now having a 10,000 uh, dimensional vector, so a vector of size 10,000 for each word, we will have a 300 dimensional vector and we will use the notation E. So just remember we use the notation O for the one hot encoded vector. And so for the for the uh, word man, which is at 5391 uh, number index in the vocabulary. So E is the e is the feature vector. So now if we if we return to the examples again, I want a glass of orange dash. I want a glass of apple dash. Orange and apple now share a lot of similar features, which makes it easier for an algorithm to generalize between them. So you can see that uh, you can and these these features these are known as so this these are known as word embeddings. So you are basically embedding the words into an n dimensional space. Like in this case, it's a 300 dimensional space. And you can even you can even visualize your word embedding using some kind of algorithm like PCA or TSNE. So TSNE stands for T distributed uh, neighbor embedding, which is also like a principal component analysis. Uh, to basically reduce the number of dimensions. So you can visualize just for your for your understanding sake, you can visualize in two dimensions. So if you do that, you will see something like this. The words cat, fish, dog, they are near to each other. Man and woman are near to each other. King and queen are near to each other. One, two, three, four are near to each other. Apple, grape, orange, they are near to each other. And you will get a sense that more related words are clear near closer to each other. And the word embeddings came from uh, came from that like we need to embed a unique vector inside inside an n-dimensional space. So now now we'll we'll use this this word embedding. So let's see how we can take the feature representation we have extracted from each word. We'll, we'll see how these word embeddings are built. So that itself is a is a task on its own. People these days would use uh, pre-trained word embeddings, which have been trained on thousands, maybe thousands of uh, like uh, thousand dimensional space or 10,000 dimensional space. 
and uh, so for example we apply this uh, to the named entity recognition problem so the named entity recognition problem is that uh, we have seen in the previous class you have to tell whether a word is a it's a is a name or not or it's a proper noun or not so sally should be one johnson should be one sally johnson is an orange farmer so is an orange farmer all these should be zero so sally johnson is the person's name and after training on this sentence the model should find out that robert lin is an apple farmer contains robert lin as a name as uh, apple and orange have near representation so so uh, if you just if you don't train if you train this model with this sentence sally johnson is an orange farmer and you you give the model a new uh, sequence which the model has not seen let's say you give robert lin is an apple farmer so this word apple and orange so in the uh, like if you compare the word embeddings they are near to each other so the model should typically give you that robert lin is a name and uh, since apple and orange have the near representation so if you have tested your model with the sentence mahmood badri is a is a durian cultivator the network should learn the name even if it has not seen the word durian before so even if it has not seen the word during training but it should tell you that mahmood badri is a is is like is a name because because from the word embeddings so you are not learning these specific words now you are learning these kind of vectors of float numbers uh, so this word durian it's it also it is i don't know what it is but it seems like some kind of fruit so if the model learns this sentence it should be also it should also perform well on the name entity recognition task for this sentence and that's the that's the power of of word representation so the algorithms that are used to that are used to learn word embeddings so they can examine billions of words of unlabeled text so you would you would not label your text you would have billions of words and uh, for example 100 billion words to uh, and learn the representation from them and so you would typically use transfer learning so you would uh, use somebody else's word embedding which people train on many gpus keep training and then improving the word embeddings for practical purposes people don't uh, develop their own word embeddings so learn the word embeddings from a large corpus so 1 to 100 billion words or download pre trained embeddings online so you can then uh, transfer the embedding to a new task with a smaller training set for example 100000 words because these words now the word embeddings are based on a set of generic features if you have developed word embeddings from a particular task doesn't uh, doesn't make a difference if you apply it to some other some other task as well and you can continue to fine tune the word embeddings with the with the new data so you bother this if you are training if your smaller training set is big enough so you would you would uh, you would tinker with your with your word embeddings if you are if your data corpus is huge otherwise you won't touch your your word embeddings and they make the biggest difference when the task you are trying to carry out has got a relatively small training set also one of the advantages of using word embeddings is that it reduces the size of size of input so uh, rather than using a 10000 uh, the uh, one hot encoded representation of of size of a vector of size 10000 now you are using a feature vector which has got a size 300 so word embeddings have very are similar to the to the siamese network that we discussed or which is uh, from the face recognition task so if you remember we we were develop we were talking about this uh, siamese network wherein each image just has got a particular unique very label and you don't have that many number of examples so you would basically 
try to build a comparison function and try to match two images so that like this is a technique or this is a uh, this is a indirect method of of developing that face recognition task so in this problem also we you encode the face into a vector and check how similar these two vectors are and word encodings or embeddings also have the same meaning here so that's how that's how you would you would use this word embeddings and in the word embedding in the word embeddings task you are learning a representation for each word in the vocabulary and we'll discuss this algorithm so these word embeddings have got uh, some properties so one of the most fascinating properties is that you can use this for analogy reasoning so it it might not be uh, the most important nlp application but it it conveys a sense of what these word embeddings can do for example if you are if you are having a four dimensional word embeddings for these words man woman king queen apple orange so you can see that if you subtract this word embeddings man so you say e man minus a woman so e man minus e woman minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2 the rest of the numbers will be approximately 0 so you can see that similarly if you do e king minus e queen so that would be also having the same difference so the the difference is between these a man and a woman and a king king and a, and a queen is of the gender like approximately rest of the things are for example similar so that is something that these word embeddings can do so if you ask your model man is to woman such that king is to uh like the model should be able to tell queen and uh, this is a visual representation of the uh, 4d vector that has been ex extracted from the tsne algorithm it's a drawing just for visualization and uh, yeah so like we like we discussed e man minus e woman e equal to e king minus so king is to queen and so you can you can understand the similarity based on the cosine similarity so we are trying to uh, understand the similarity or the difference between a man and a woman a king and a queen so you can use the so you can you can use the cosine cosine similarity so which is uh, between two vectors u and v is u dot v divided by a product of the mod of u and v or you can use the euclidean distance now coming to the embedding matrix or the or the word embedding so when you implement uh, an algorithm to learn a word embedding what you end up with is learning an embed an embedding matrix so you have on in this uh, dimension or in this ax along this axis is the size or the number of features or the size of your or the number of dimensions in the, of your embeddings and on x axis on, on the other axis is your number of words so for example if you have 10000 words so you are trying to create a matrix e of the shape 300 cross 10000 and in this case we are extracting 300 features so if o is your one hot encoded representation which just has a number one like all the numbers 9999 nine, nine, nine numbers are zero just one number is one then then a dot product of e and o at 6257 will give you the word embedding at 6257 so which is of shape 300 comma 1 so in the next sections you will see how to first initialize e and randomly and then try to learn the parameters of this matrix so we will very quickly see uh, how to learn the word embeddings so at the start uh, of like uh, we will see how to learn these word embeddings and so these were complex and then they kept on getting simpler and simpler and uh, so for example we have this uh, we have this sentence i want a glass of orange dash so we are trying to build a language model so that we can predict the next word and we are trying to build this this word embeddings so we will use the neural network to learn the language model so this word i has got a one hot encoded representation as 04343 
Now this one, you will take a dot product with the embedding matrix. You will get the word embedding for the word I. Similarly for want a glass of water. So you will pass. So these are all now 1D vectors of size 300. You will pass these as input to a neural network. And this is the, uh, and then the output is your softmax. So softmax, what it is consisting of 10,000 words. So what are you trying to do? You are trying to predict the next word. So the in, in that process, you are updating your the weights of your embeddings. So that is how this is this is like one of the step of, of building your your word embeddings. So I think yeah, so it's it's three, four, and we will uh, we will end this climate data science class uh, for now here. And uh, we will we will start with the we will start